Takže dobrý večer jménem Národního pedagogického institutu vás a vítám na dnešním webináři, který se jmenuje English is not boring a který je realizován v rámci projektu SIPO. English is not boring. Um, so uh, this is the name of the seminar, but I believe that no subject is really boring and almost all subjects can be fun for students. Provided, let's see if I can get this presentation. I think, yes, okay. Provided subject matter is relevant to the students. Students play active role in their learning. Students are respected and seen and the environment is friendly, fun and enjoyable. Now I'll tell you a little bit about my experience. I learned quite early on in my career uh, when I was teaching in kindergarten, I taught at all different levels and I also taught at kindergarten. And there I really learned that without motivation, there really isn't learning. When I tried uh, to teach kids uh, something without actually thinking what, uh, whether, whether or not the activity was suitable or interesting, very often they would not repeat after me. They, they would not listen to me and often they would tell uh, tell each other and me that they're really bored and they don't want to be there. So I really, I was very frustrated, as you can imagine. And at times, I must say, I didn't like my work very much because I worked really hard. I prepared my lessons and I, you know, I put a lot of effort into, into the lessons, but um, without much effect and uh, nobody really enjoyed it. So, well, at, the, at, at that time, I thought, well, you know, I'm pretty sure it's not my English, that can't be the problem. So it must have been the kids, right? Well, maybe wrong. I was, it was not until later that I realized that, uh, you know, when I actually prepared activities uh, that the kids enjoyed thoroughly, that the learning came naturally and we all had fun and the kids and I actually uh, didn't have to work real hard. And uh, we realized that the learning really uh, came as a byproduct of authentic like activities. So it really depended on the activities, whether the kids like the activities or not. It was not learning for the learning sake, but really whether the kids would be able to immerse themselves in the activities. When they did, they didn't even realize they were learning. And that was the beauty of it. And ever since then, I really kind of approach learning in this way. And that is at all levels, whether I was teaching at university, now high, uh, high school, or when I teach adults. Okay, so um, if, because I believe that if all activities are done in English and students are active because they are interested in the activities, the learning comes naturally and with ease. And what's more, um, if students are active and working real hard, well, then I actually leave classroom not frustrated, but elated, happy, and I'm actually looking forward to the next one. Okay, so um, anyway, well, the content of this seminar is, well, we're going to have a look at relevance, uh, teacher versus facilitator, pair and teamwork, uh, topic-based teaching, and then we're going to have a look at fun activities. I know that probably all of you are expecting, oh, we're going to do a lot of fun activities that we can use in our classroom, and we will look at some, but I think you can get all this uh, on the internet. I think it's uh, kind of for me, for me anyway, what was the eye-opener in my teaching career was, uh, you know, that it's, it's a lot to do with the method rather than with the activities themselves. So there will be activities at the end, but I'd like to share with you kind of my experience uh, with teaching. Um, uh, and um, anyway, so when it comes to relevance, and I am talking at this stage at high school level, I would say that uh, from my perspective, the problem is often the textbook. And you, I'm sure most of you realize this, that you have the same problem. Okay, the problem is here that the textbook may be problematic in terms of relevance and level. Okay, uh, the problem is, at least from my perspective, uh, as I'm teaching at high school, is that uh, the textbook is set often way before we get to see our students. And sometimes it's set by completely different teachers. We get a textbook and we are asked to teach, okay? The problem is that, uh, you know, the textbook uh, may be quite difficult to change. So, uh, so what we need to kind of think is about the themes and activities, which uh, with the textbook, I think are problematic in, in terms of their generic, uh, which means, you know, the, the, the textbook is trying to kind of uh, address the problems of all students. However, it may be irrelevant to your group because of the specific needs of the students. Plus, they may find some of the, uh, 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 some of the exercises uninteresting, tedious, 
and very often repetitive. Uh, very often, and this is uh, my case, I don't know if it's your case, but uh, I find that the textbook that is set for the course is too simple. In, in my case, it's always too simple, but it may be also too difficult, it depends. But in my case, it, from my experience, it's too simple, okay? So students are actually getting better and better. I'm getting like every year, the students are much better than they were the year before but we're actually using the same textbook, which obviously can be a bit of a problem. I mean, think about it from the parent perspective. I have, uh, I have kids that are entering and studying at, at high school, and imagine that they actually leaving primary school with the level of B1, B2, some even higher, and they start at the high school with A2 level. So like from my, from my perspective as a parent, well, not so happy because I want my students to achieve higher and, and move forward. And they're actually going backwards. From the student's perspective, when you think about it, you know, I mean, imagine they come to high school with certain level and then they're being taught level a lot, high, a lot lower. I mean, you know, how would you feel if you had to, for four years, do something which seems pretty simple? And it is. I mean, you know, again, I'm talking from my experience. Uh, for example, my first year students now, we wrote a uh, uh, didaktický test and they all passed it. Most of them with at uh, 85 to 90 percent first graders that's maturita okay and but as i said the, the problem with the textbook is that it's already set so from from my perspective well, what is important is to getting to know your student so uh the you know so this is why it's kind of important to to get to know your students now um i usually do this like uh when i start my classes with uh full picture presentation uh, this is like a kind of mini project uh, the pictures can be almost about anything, but um, I usually tell students to bring pictures uh, about their PC game that they like playing, a picture about person they like spending their time with, food they love eating, outdoor activity they like participating in. Okay, so these four pictures, they bring these pictures and then they ask to actually describe these pictures. Again, when you think about it, in a lot of the textbooks, they are asked to describe pictures that are given in the textbook, but they may be about things that they might not want to talk about or things that uh, they don't know what to say about. So this way, it's much easier to talk about pictures and activity that they have to do in the textbook or in the course anyway. But as they actually present those pictures, well, you know, it tells me a lot about their level of the language. So we do. I do this right at the beginning of the of, of the year. So I can assess very quickly their level of English, but also their interests, which then helps me uh, think about the you know how to how to uh, structure structure the lessons and how much I actually will rely on the textbook that is uh, set. So you know I think it is kind of important uh, to be flexible in your classroom, yeah? Because skills and topics are set by syllabus and curriculum, but we don't have to rigidly uh, or strict, strictly, um, I mean, st we don't have to rigid, rigid, be rigid. We don't have to stick. We don't have to stick rigidly to the, the, the textbook itself. The textbook from my perspective should be at the backbone at the best, at the best. Uh, when it comes to syllables, from my perspective, syllabus tells me what to teach, but not how to teach it. Yeah, and since uh, since yes, yeah, since since uh, no group is the same, well, I kind of vary this. I vary the level. Sometimes I vary the topics. Uh, whether the tuition uh, will be enjoyable or not, so I, I think so. The relevance is very important, but whether the tuition will be enjoyable or not, I would say also depends on the classroom management and the role of the teacher in the classroom. Uh, so here we have the teacher facilitator versus facilitator. I think uh, what we need to kind of consider is whether our classes are teacher centered or they are student centered. Okay, student-centered or teacher-centered? How do we know? I think it's, you know, like, you know, the question is, how do we know? Well, who does most of the talking in the class? Not today, it's me, but normally in my classes, it's not me. Who is active and who's passive? Who comes up with all the information? Who has all the answers? And who is almost always right? 
if the if the answer is teacher, well then such classroom is clearly teacher centered. Um, and if teacher does actually most of the talking either to the class or to specific individuals, then the rest of the class are basically inactive for most of the lesson. Now, I mean, look at it from the perspective of the student. How do you think the rest of the students are actually feeling during such lesson when they're sitting and just listening? How long do you think they'll be able to focus and listen? In my class, when I do this, I can see it quickly. Five, five minutes, 10 minutes, they start fiddling with the mobile phones and stuff. And you can see that they're just looking out of the window. They're not really concentrating, therefore they're not learning. So wasted time for, for, for all of us. And also think about, well, how much do you think they learn through just listening and being inactive, which I think you just answered. In a student-centered classroom, I think the roles I turned around a little, I would say a lot. Okay, students usually do all the work or and most and most of the speaking, usually among themselves. In my case, they do it usually in pair and teamwork. Um, this, however, doesn't mean like when you know, like when you say, okay, well, this is going to be student-centered, and the teacher kind of goes, uh, takes the kind of backseat, if you like, and becomes facilitator. It does not actually mean that in such classroom the teacher relinquishes the control. That's, that's not the case. What, what the teacher does, teacher sets the boundaries of learning. The teacher determines the skills and topics, okay? It's the teacher manages the class, okay? The teacher actually supervises your students uh, or makes sure that the students actually understand what needs to be done and they're actually doing it. So the teacher, in, in fact, becomes the facilitator of learning. Now, I actually got, uh, I got a quote from, uh, from Wikipedia of what facilitator is, so you can read it if you like. If not, it doesn't matter. But the facilitator is really a person. It's, it's more like a referee, if you like. Yeah? It just supervises the game. Game here is of learning, really. Okay, the, uh, the facilitator is not the fountain of knowledge and the one that lectures everybody. Facilitator tends to be neutral and allows students to express themselves. Facilitator really creates environment in which learning can take place naturally, I would say. And in such, uh, in such environment, learning becomes a really byproduct of the activities that students do. Okay, so very often in my classes, I'm, I'm sure this is probably a case in your classes, students actually don't know why they're doing it. But there is a purpose. We, we play games and do activities that, uh, as I always say, well, we're going to play games which are not games because we're playing games, but there is a language issue that, that is always at heart. But the students don't often realize because they're just doing some activities that they're, they're happy to be doing um, and, and we'll go through them. Okay, for example, so how do, how do we do it? For example, if uh, we want to teach, for example, present simple, uh, uh, well, we don't spend, I, I mean, I don't spend whole lesson like, you know, explaining present simple and, you know, devoting most of the time explaining it and then doing some kind of mindless exercises, tedious exercises from the textbook. Instead, we th I think of kind of real context. And when, when I think of present simple, well, then present simple is always using habits, okay, or, or routine routine stuff. So, for example, I give students the topic, uh, which we did recently, uh, for example, social media. They love talking about social media because they spend most of the time, you know, in social media. And I ask them, okay, well, let's talk about social media and let's think about some of the questions, okay, that we could be asking each other. We'll be going to do pair work. And so in the pair work, uh, what, what happens is before we do the pair work, Together as class, we come up with maybe five, six questions. One of them is, well, which social medias do you follow? Uh, are you addicted to social medias? Uh, do you, uh, uh, how much time do you spend? And so we're using present simple because that's, you know, that's what we are talking about. And so I get them to do it in pairs. And so they use the present simple. And then I also ask them to jot down the information about the other person. So they can actually use also the third person or singular, which is obviously difficult for them to use. And that's why I want to practice it. And so they actually write down the information about 
the student they're they're working with, and then I ask them to change pairs. But they don't repeat the same activity. What they do is they actually talk about the person they have just finished talking talking to. So they actually telling the other person what does the other person likes doing, what, what does he like doing. Okay, so they actually use the third person of singular. So so we do activities like this. It doesn't have to be about social media. It can be about any any kind of habit or things that uh, students uh, like spending their time doing. Okay, so, um, and well, really, uh, the reason I prefer students to do most of the work in pairs and in teams is because, well, they, if they get really meaningful problem solving activity or mini project, as I call them, uh, they will be actively working all the time. And all of them are working, not just the teacher and one student, but they're working all the time. So um, this brings us to pair and teamwork, okay? So if you have the problem solving activities or mini projects, uh, uh, I would say that all, the, as I said, um, you know, all of the students are active at, all, at the same time. Uh, they're usually motivated to find solution. If, they, if, if it's meaningful, if it's, if it's something that they really want to be talking about, something they'd like to be solving, well, then they will, be, they will have to agree, disagree, negotiate, and they, they really get into it, not realizing that they're really doing English because they're trying to solve a problem. They also are very likely to be helping each other if they're working in pairs on small teams, small teams meaning three to maximum four, four students. If you have more, you probably from your experience see that uh, there are some students that tend to not to work. Um, and uh, they're less likely to be afraid to make mistakes. Uh, imagine, I mean, even like, you know, uh, when you're speaking to people, uh, to like imagine the student has to speak in front of the whole class, uh, then the student is very likely to be afraid, especially if they're introverts, like uh, a lot of my students are. Whereas when they work in pairs and, and teams, they're more likely to open up and not to be afraid to make mistakes. And uh, they, of course, also get to know each other better if they're working in teams. I do vary. They not talk in the same pairs every lesson. I like to kind of get them to mingle around because this way they get to know each, each, each other better and they work better as as group and they I think the problem sometimes is that students come in to class, they sit in one spot, sit next to one person, and they spend like four years talking to the same person. So I try to make sure that they mingle and they get to know each other. And, and I think they, they work they work better than as a, as a team. Um, okay, so now I'd like to um, illustrate how I put this into practice, okay? So this is like kind of, if you like, a uh, theory part from my, my perspective. Now, um, yeah, and of course they have more fun if, if the activities are uh, activities that they like doing, of course. And they're doing it in pairs and, and in teams. You, you see them laughing and joking and stuff. If, if they're just sitting and listening to me, uh, there's not a lot, a lot of laughter going on. Okay, now the way I teach is basically like textbooks, okay? I, I use the textbook, I use the syllables, syllabus or, you know, the curriculum. Sometimes I stick to the textbook, sometimes I don't, but I do it same as textbooks, uh, meaning that, uh, you know, it's topic-based learning. Uh, you come up with a topic. In this case, for this seminar, I, I, I picked housing, but I could be talking about food. I could be talking about modern technologies, law and order, entertainment, you name it. I would do it very much the same as I do it with, for example, housing. Okay, I, I think this is how most of us are doing it anyway. Uh, um, I'll just go through the through this, some of the some of the areas that we're going to discuss. Or I'm going to discuss. So first one, I always start with vocabulary because you want to make sure that the students have the vocabulary necessary for the the rest of the activities. Okay, and I do that through brainstorming, which I'll show you. I think we all know brainstorming, but anyway, uh, then. We could be doing reading. Sometimes I do reading. Sometimes I don't do reading. It depends. Uh, we always do speaking. Even when we do reading, then we do follow-up exercise with speaking. Again, in pairs, teams, uh, because I think this is, for, for me, this is the most important part of my lessons, speaking. And surely grammar, but the grammar is inbuilt in speaking, in my case. Anyway, then we do listening, of course. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the language skill, how that can be inbuilt into speaking exercises. 
And then we do project, which uh, students usually love. Uh, and then if need be, we do writing. Now with the writing, uh, depending on uh, the grade I'm teaching, uh, it may uh, vary, it may, uh, it may look differently, but we'll talk about it when we get to it. Okay, so with the vocabulary, okay, so when we come to vocabulary, well, as I said, well, I do brainstorming, okay? There's nothing exciting about it. I think we all know brainstorming, but what I do is I always uh, draw a circle uh, on the whiteboard and write the topic. So in this case, it's house, okay? Because we can be talking about housing, homes. And then I ask students to tell me the areas of house that we could be thinking of, okay? And they may come up, like if, if for example, we're talking food, they may say vegetables or fruit or meat, okay? When it comes to house, well, they may say, okay, I can't see it because I see myself here, but I think it's rooms, yes, rooms. Uh, the next one, for example, may be furniture. The next one could be outside, types of housing, verbs, adjectives that could be associated with housing, okay? And so I put this on the whiteboard, and then I, decide, uh, I tell them, Usually I, I get them to work in small teams rather than in pairs, but sometimes in pairs and teams, you know how it's done. I give them usually around five minutes to come up with as many words as possible associated with house and these, uh, these areas that we have come up with. And, uh, you know, I tell them I expect between 20 to 50 words. And then at the end, what we do is I usually get one participant from a team to come and write on the whiteboard uh, and we cover one of the areas. So for example, if we cover rooms, so we talk about the rooms like, you know, laundry and, you know, our living room and, and so on. And the, the, the person writes it, then he goes, uh, he or she goes back and sits down. Then we get from a different group and they again write the words on the whiteboard. Once we have all the words, then we also I try to kind of uh, well, I talk to them uh, and see if it can come up with more words because I obviously know the words that I want to see on the whiteboard because I know that these words will be in, in different exercises and these are the words that I want them to learn. So um, usually I don't, if, if I can help it, I don't actually tell them the words. I may tell them, for example, you know, the room where we may keep uh, the washing machine and they may know laundry. They may not know it. If they don't know it, I usually give it to them. Or sometimes I tell them, I can find it on a, on, a, on a mobile phone. What was it called? And similarly with outside or something like that. And, and so we, we add a few more words so that we really have uh, really close to 40, 50 words. And then uh, we move to the next topic. Uh, usually I have actually speaking, but you know uh, this time I think I have reading here. Uh, because I wanted to illustrate that, yes, we can do the reading in a kind of interesting way uh, with the, in, within the same topic. So uh, the way I like to do it is like kind of small text matching information. I found this one on the internet. I think it's from the ESL uh, Collective. I think this is a fantastic site. You probably all know about it. There are loads of uh, activities and uh, exercises that you can get for free. Um, so I got it off of, of this one. But this is type of reading that I like doing because uh, when you give them long text, even no matter how, how uh, uh, no matter what level they are at, like uh, some of my students at C1 level, and I give them, of course, reading from, C, uh, from CA textbooks and stuff, but they find it like a bit daunting. So I, I prefer to do it like with small chunks of text, cross-matching and stuff. And this is also a type of exercise you find in Maturita, of course, without the pictures. But anyway, so this is a kind of reading that they, 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 they do. When, they, when it comes to speaking, again, it's uh, very much uh, the speaking goes throughout whole topic. Now, this is, I really like these series and I can't see it much because there's, there's a bar here and stuff. But you can see, let's talk about I don't know if you know the series. Uh, some of you may already know this. Some of you may use it. Some of you might not. If you don't, this is a very good series. And you can again find it, I think. No, I can't. 
it's not popping up what's going on uh, i did uh -huh, yeah yeah you can find it on this side uh esl collective um it's a fantastic i think fantastic uh, uh speaking material um i of course tell my students that they don't necessarily have to discuss all the questions and um in the series there are loads of different topics and it's they all done in the same manner you've got um you know something like i don't know what this is about like 15 questions then you have also follow up some of the uh, questions that the students may create and also uh you have some of the vocabulary so they also go through the vocabulary again speaking is done uh, in my case uh, usually speaking is done in, in pairs okay and then there is another site um that i use uh equally good i mean i, I must say i like let's talk about i like it better than this one but what i like about this one which, which you can find uh, i don't know what's going on here eseldiscussions.com uh what i like about it is that there's a lot more a lot more topics you have it's it's it goes in alphabetical order and like if you type a you'll have like i don't know 20 different topics uh ranging from I don't know, address, aids, you know, it's just, just basically anything you can think of. And it goes in alphabetical order. And there's loads of these. They're all very, very similar in a way that usually the, 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 the first question is about the topic. So if it's home and house, uh, you know, it's all, you can see always this question, what comes to mind when you hear the word home, house, environment, or whatever the topic is. But as I said, uh, it's, it's fantastic in a way that that any topic you can think of and you'll find it there with the let's let, let's talk about uh it's a lot more limited i think there are like 30 30 30 worksheets whereas here i would say there's like 100 worksheets okay so i think this is very good i use it uh with my students all the time speaking uh when it comes to listening uh when it comes to listening now i uh of course, we, we do the stuff from the textbook, but very often, as I said, my problem is that the textbook we are assigned or, you know, the textbook students are to buy is very low level. And when it comes to listening, the students really are at this, this, this like now they, they, their level is really high because they, they follow the, you know, the YouTubes play computer, uh, when they play computer games, they play them in English, they have their TikToks and whatever, uh, series, sitcoms, and they watch it all in English. So usually the listening is very low level. So what I try to do is obviously find a topic kind of uh, listening, but I go to YouTube and find something that I I feel students might be interested in. This is why it's important to get to know your students. Now, I have IT students and my IT students have a lot of experience with 3D printers. They are into 3D printers. They actually show me in their presentations what can be done with 3D printers, what they do with 3D printers. So for me, it was logical to go into the, you know, 3D printed house and, you know, how the house is actually 3D printed. And for them, of course, this is exciting. This is interesting. If you do listening something from a textbook, which is low level and something which is generic, they might not be really interested to do it. Whereas this, they do. And as I said, like with reading, with, with uh, listening and any other activities, I always follow up with questions and speaking. So the questions may be related to actually uh, the, uh, what they're listening. Uh, too, so that they have some questions to see that they, they actually understood. Uh, if there are words that I am pretty sure are quite difficult, I write them on the whiteboard as we do the listening, and then we uh, then I check if students actually understand. Here, I may ask them, how long does it take to print the house? Um, obviously, the answer is in the listening. Uh, what are advantages and disadvantages of this uh, of this process? Do you think uh, there is future in a housing industry with 3D printing? Or would you have your house built in this way? And do you think that the whole cities could be printed in future? So these are some of the questions that they get and they, they discuss in, in pairs. So not only they watch it, but then it kind of sparks converse, conversation. And for me, as I said, that's that's the most important thing. Because I, I like, the the most thing the the things that i say the most in my classroom would be after i said 
tasks is English, please. Speak English, English. I just make sure that students are speaking in English. And if they're actually talking about, as I said, meaningful thing, they want to be talking. Uh, so they're talking in English. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's great because when you think about it, where, where else do they get the opportunity to speak in English? And as I said, like, uh, you know, uh, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, there is grammar inbuilt into into speaking as well. It's not like, you know, they're just speaking and, and they could be saying yeah, almost anything and I we don't check them and they're just speaking and nothing else. But anyway, the other possible videos, because you may have different groups, you may, again, from internet, obviously this would be really interesting for my students. You know, if, uh, Elon Musk is there really into Elon Musk. So this is uh, about like module houses. But you know, if, uh, you know, if you have maybe different groups, maybe you could be uh, watching about, uh, you know, five most expensive homes of YouTubers because they all follow YouTubers. I know from my students, but also from my kids, you know, uh, this is why it's, I would say, uh, relatively important to find out, you know, what are the interests of your students or you could be doing something like Cave House, although this is quite long. I, I would not. Uh, show a video which is which is over about seven minutes because you don't want to spend a whole lesson doing it uh, because you still want to do the speaking and other activities. Okay, so this brings us to language skills. Okay, so uh, well, the first one I have here is present simple. Now we've spoke about present simple, so I don't want to really spend too much time about it because basically, if you want to use present simple. Well, then you speak about housing in general, because if you talk in general, we use present simple. Where do you live? And so on, questions like this. I don't think I need to really explain that. So, uh, okay, so that's that's one of the language skills. However, when we do speaking, uh, and we do speaking about housing, I think it's very good to use the speculative language. And I urge my students to do speculative language and use uh, second conditional. Now, if I tell my class in my class second conditional, nobody knows what it is, and they tell you we can't use it, and rightly so. However, if you write on a whiteboard, if you could choose, and then we come up with some of the questions, would you live in a house or flat? You can have relatively, relatively uh, uh, class of relatively. Uh, not high skills of English level, and yet, I mean, we, we used to do this with with primary school kids you know they don't need to know the grammar they just use the phrase would you live in a house or flat yes i would no i wouldn't why would you okay and they know they need to use these the, the, this phrase uh, the would they don't know why they don't know it's a second condition on why why do they need to but they use it within the context how many rooms would it have it would have two three four five why okay uh, would you live in a, a city or country? Okay, we're speculating. We're not talking about real stuff. So we don't, we, we're not using present simple. We use conditional in context. Or would you have a swimming pool, indoor, outdoor? Or would you choose to live in the Czech Republic or abroad? If you have advanced students, well, then you can uh, elicit the questions from them. You can ask them and you just write the questions. Uh, usually I have to start them off with one or two and then they usually come flowing. So I get four, five, six, and then get students, sometimes get them in teams, sometimes in pairs, depending again, and they're talking. And then it's uh, also good to get maybe the feedback. So they might tell each other, you know, so the teams would tell us how many and, you know, share it, share it in a class, uh, you know. But any, any, uh, anyway, so so this is how they actually uh use the language appropriate the one that again as i said the teacher's facilitator i actually set the language without them actually realizing this is the set, this is the language we're going to learn we're going to be learning conditionals but they don't have to know that we are learning conditionals they've got the phrases they they get to use them and maybe later once once they know how to use it then maybe we can talk about it as Hey, look, you know, this is actually second conditional. Second conditional is formed this way and this way, you know, past and would. Okay. But uh, but I don't have the need to really explain it to them and they really don't need to know 
because if I, again, as I said earlier, if I spend a lot of time explaining it to them, usually they won't pay attention, they won't listen, they won't learn, they need to practice. And they practice, as I said, in uh, during uh, when they are some meaningful exercises. Now, project here, I picked one uh, which the kids really love doing, and uh, all, all, my, all my students are ID students, and they have computers. So what we do here is it's, it's kind of one of the projects that they love doing, and uh, they get it once a year, and they actually build their house in uh, using Minecraft. Now, a lot of the people would say, Minecraft, they actually playing computer game in lesson? Come on, like, you know, shouldn't they be learning? But then think about it, okay? Uh, they're not doing it individually. They're doing it in pairs or in a team of three, not more than three, okay? So when they decide, they all know Minecraft, they are very skillful at it. All kids are, I think, of, of this age. And so I tell them, okay, well, you know, build a house in Minecraft. Well, what do they have to do? Well, they have to decide what kind of house, how big it's going to be, what's going to be in the house, where the house is going to be set, uh, what, are, uh, what, what, what equipment the house is going to have, furnishings and stuff, and they actually need to be discussing it because they're building it together. They can't just build it and say, okay, well, this is my house without actually speaking. So during that lesson, usually I, I give them one to two lessons to build it. Uh, they're actually speaking a lot. This is not, it may seem like, you know, the wasted lesson, but it is not wasted lesson because what they're doing is they're actually speaking. They are discussing and they're uh, agreeing, disagreeing and, you know, uh, using the vocabulary that we started off at the beginning. And they really are. Well, in my class, anyway, they are speaking. So uh, for me, it's uh, it's very valuable. And also they realize that in English lessons, they can do something which is real cool and real fun. So they are then motivated to do other lessons. We don't do this like every second lesson. As I said, we do it once, once a year, but we do the projects with every topic. Uh, but the project is not going, going to be Minecraft. And I'm going to show you how else you can do it if, you, if your students don't have computers or, you know, again, you may be doing it the same way. And then, so uh, not only that they build it, but then obviously what they do is with 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 the uh, with the house, uh, then they present it in class. And again, they have to tell us and take us through the house. Okay, so tell us why they built uh, these rooms, why why they have this type of furnishing, what, and and so on. So so they again talking about it in class, and the class is asking. And I must say, we have usually lots of fun with this. Now, if you don't, if your students don't have computers, well, why don't you do storyboard, okay? Uh, we used to do this uh, with primary students, primary school students. Storyboard, we ask them, bring a picture. They bring picture of a house. If they're three, they'll bring three different pictures of a house. They have to agree on the, on the picture, on their house. And again, they do very much the same thing. Why did they choose this house? What does it look like? Why? And so on. Then they then they're going to bring picture of different rooms. So they bring kitchen. Again, they need to describe the kitchen. Uh, then they have uh, living room, uh, bedroom, and uh, uh, the gaming room. Again, you can you can they can present it again to class. So basically, same thing. You're not using the computer. You're not using the game, but you're using the pictures, and you do the same activity. Okay, so this is this is how I do the uh, the topic based kind of teaching. And as I said, uh, the the end of it is writing. Okay, we uh, sometimes we don't always write, but quite often we do. And then uh, clearly, what the students are writing are description of their house, whether it's going to be uh, the one from the Minecraft or from the storyboard. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I get them to write it in a team, especially if they're like first, second graders or third graders. Uh, fourth graders, I ask them to write, the, write it individually because they're really preparing for maturita and they really should be able to do it by then uh, quite at ease. They should be, be at ease with writing. But first grade, second grade, they're writing it together. And sometimes, very often, I then ask them to read it in class so we get to see whether you know the description is similar to what we have seen, whether they're using the right words and so on. And again, we're helping each other. So we do it as a team. I sit back and usually get the class to comment rather than me being at the center, just the students. Of course, if the, if the team or the students are very passive, 
then I have to get them motivated, which obviously happens. Now, finally, the fun activities. Now, I don't have a lot of fun activities that I want to share with you uh, that you would not know, but maybe, maybe I do it slightly differently than some of you. So uh, the first one is bingo. I think we all know bingo. Okay. Uh, this is where I, uh, this is a, uh, this is a place where I actually created this bingo. Again, as you can see, it's topic topical. Okay. So I, I actually wrote phrasal verbs that you could be using in uh, the context of housing or house. Okay. So you have turn on, like a, turn on a TV or something, take out rubbish, wash up, put away your clothes or things, you know, and so on. So, so, so the, the vocabulary is topical. And now the way we play it is, I, we, I, I assume that we all know how bingo is played, but uh, in the bingo, I never actually read the words out. I explain, so I paraphrase them, and then students actually have to guess what uh, phrasal verb I used. Uh, and usually I start it off myself. First game, I'm the, the, the one who, who does that. And then what we do is that the, the winner of the game usually gets some lolly or something, and then is expected to, to take over my role. So the students are doing it. I like it even better from this bingo, which is from a textbook, uh, from one of, the, one of the activities book. And uh, the reason I like it is because this is a kind of reading I like doing. Okay, uh, as you can see, these are the places, it's not to do with house, but you have places like school, station, bus stop, uh, you cut it up, kids get uh, the cards, and then you read the place without actually saying it. So if you're reading the, but before we do that, we always go through the difficult vocabulary. For example, if you have, I know that there was like a hotel, there is uh, something like ensuite, they have ensuite facilities, students have problems with that. Some Sometimes they have problems to know what twin or double bed, double bedroom, twin bedroom, double bedroom, you know, so, so we go through the vocabulary and then we play it. But again, usually I start with the reading um, and then the first, uh, the, the first winner actually does the reading. So the students do the reading. Very often I don't start reading. I just pick, pick a student and the student reads this in random order. And then when students have five or six of these, they call up bingo. And we repeat, we play this game maybe three, four times uh, in that one lesson, because that way they get used to the vocabulary, the foreign vocabulary or the new vocabulary, and uh, more students get to get to read. So anyway, um, then we have domino. Again, I don't think I need to explain domino. But a lot of the times people think well, domino is for kids. I don't know. Maybe you have this approach, but I don't. I, I do dominoes, for example, with phrasal verbs. Okay. And uh, uh, so, so they're learning phrasal verbs. We go through the phrasal verbs and we have phrasal verb, uh, like, for example, uh, take off and then the definition, like, for example, leave the ground and uh, students play uh, the domino. Now, why I wanted to talk about domino is because, like, when I started with domino, we would play it once and then I felt, okay, we played it. That's it. Okay, pack it up. And like, because it would be boring to play it second time. And it took me a while, a few years, until I realized that the more you actually play it, the better it is. Because with the phrasal verbs, they're quite difficult. And the first time, students really struggled to put the domino kind of, you know, to, to link it up. And so the first time they struggled, they're not sure what they're doing. And if you say, okay, back it up, well, they kind of, you know, they were intrigued but they didn't get the sense of achievement, which they get if you play it second, third or fourth time. And if they feel, well, oh, why are we playing it fourth time? You may say, okay, now let's see if you can do it really quick and I'll time you. And then they're even more motivated to do it really fast. But really they're getting used to the, the words that actually they, they're, they're using. So um, this is anyway, so I, I learned that, or I found out this, maybe you've already knew this, but uh, for me, it took me a while to work it out. Okay, I'll, I'll go through quickly a few more. I, uh, I think uh, uh, the false and true exercise, I, I really love. Um, I got it from some textbook, but I don't know where from. So I created this sheet uh, so you can see it and I, I don't have to um, kind of search where it was from. But basically you, you, you get students to work in teams and you uh, ask them to discuss some questions. These are very simple questions, but you can go to more complex questions, which are, have you ever using present perfect? Again, you know, uh, 
I just wanted to illustrate that we use different grammar in these exercises. It's not just talking, 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 mindless talking. Okay, so uh, with these questions, like for example, if you go to the, the more complex, uh, for example, the you know present perfect, uh, sometimes I give them just prompts. So they have to turn this into a question, like have you ever been in hospital? Uh, or to hospital, and uh, sometimes I don't give them anything. I just say, okay, let's let's come up with the questions. I may give them one, and as you can see, number nine, number ten is not filled, so they come up with two. Sometimes they come up with eight. And anyway, so they, these are general questions. And now the the, the way the game is played is that uh, if let's say uh, students are in team of four, but usually I, I like to have them in team of three. No two, two is not good for this game three or four, four maximum, five is too many students. And what they need to do, they need to write their name, uh, not their name, but the names of the players they play with. They write it under the name column, and then they're asking each other the question. But they ask that question that many times how many players they are. So, you know, one person asks the question, the person who's sitting next to, and the person's going to answer. And the, the, the answer could be either true or false. Okay, so they could be lying and they love, you know, fibbing and stuff. And the rest of the team needs to work out, well, is this person lying or telling the truth? Okay, and then the, the person who, who was asked, asks the next person. And then everybody else listens and thinks, okay, is this person telling the truth? And under their name, they tick either true or false. Okay, and we do the round for one question. Then we do second question, third question, and so on until the end. And then at the end, they actually discuss, they check whether the, the answers were true or false. I also, of course, I want them to expand, not to just say, yes, I have, no, I haven't, but then expand. And within the expanded answer, maybe the, the, the lie. Okay, because like, you know, have you ever cheated in test? I would say all students would answer yes. If they answer no, I haven't, we all know that they, they're lying. So, but they may say, yes, I have never cheated in, for example, English test, which may be true. Um, okay, so anyway, and then they check, uh, you know, they, they talk about it, true, false, and they count the points and see who, who is the best at cheating, who is the best at guessing. And you can vary this game. Uh, you know, you can, you can come up with different questions. You can use conditionals and, and, and so on. Okay, I, I think that's almost it. I've got spotted game, which I think may be useful to most, some of you. I don't know if you, if you play spotted, but uh, I must say kids love it uh, from kindergarten to, to high school. Spotted is in Czech uh, double. Uh, you probably know it from your kids. Uh, we play double, but usually you buy them in, uh, in uh, shop. And there are set pictures that you use. But uh, with this generator, you can actually generate your own double cards. Uh, the game is in each card, there is always one word that uh, is uh, that matches. Now, I don't really want to, because I don't have much time to explain it. But you, you uh, if you don't know this game, uh, the, the check name is double. You can find find it, find it out uh, where it is. But uh, you can create it yourself, OK? If you if you go to this website, you can you can put the words you want to put in. So it doesn't have to be one where you buy it and the picture is given. You actually can write your own words. And as you can see, again, these are topical to the house. But you could have phrasal verbs. I have uh, uh, games where you have uh, where you have uh, uh, irregular verbs because you know kids and irre irre irregular verbs. So sometimes I have normal verb. They have to say the irre irregular verb. And uh, I varied uh, differently. And um, so they love playing this, this kind of game. So anyway, you, you'll get all the, all, the, all the links and everything you get. Uh, this is the last game that I really wanted to share with you. There, there are a lot more, but I think you know the games. You, you'll, you, you can play activity and stuff like that. But th these cards are fantastic. I really love them. Students love them. If you don't know this series, it's called Fun Card. Uh, they're available through, sh uh, through shops here. This is basically Uno. All kids love playing Uno. But the way you play it is, you can see here, you have a question. If you want to play the card, uh, not question, but there is a set grammar. Now, because I have relatively advanced students, as you can see, I have cards which are conditionals. I have third uh, 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 
past perfect, I have reported speech, but I have present perfect, but there are also prepositions, present simple, present continuous, all grammatical, all, all, all grammar. So if you don't know it, fantastic cards. Now, when the kids actually play them, so let's let's pick one. For example, I don't know uh, here the hippo said, I don't know where my mummy is, okay? And this is reported speech. So the kid, if the kid wants to play this card, he or she has to turn it into reported uh, reported speech. Now, we practice reported speech before we play it, but if they're not sure, the beauty of the card is that the answer is on the other side. So if they're really not sure, they can read it. So the hippo said that he didn't know where his mummy was. And same with conditionals and past perfects, as you can see. I think it's a fantastic game. Uh, the, the only problem with it is that if you have larger classroom uh, classes, then you may need to have like at least two packs per class. I like playing exploding kittens and all different games. Again, you may say, well, but they don't speak much. Yes, they do, because they, again, they have to come up with strategies. They need to be speaking to each other. And it's not like we are playing a whole lesson, but uh, it gets, gets them speaking. Now, I really would like to finish. Uh, I think we, we there is a time to finish. I, I would like to also answer some of your questions. And to finish off, I would like to finish with a quote, which I find inspirational. And this is uh, something that I always think about. Uh, so I won't read it. You can read it yourselves. Uh, hopefully, you'll find it inspirational too. If not, well, anyway. Um, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm just quickly going to get to the questions. <laughs> yeah, the first one is a very, very interesting question, okay? Uh, what textbook do you use at your high school and which type of high school are you teaching at? Thank you. Now, I don't know if I can really say this, okay? Uh, <laughs> I don't want to get into trouble. But I teach in Delta High School, which is in Pardubice. It's IT school. And as I said, the students level, but I, I would say most of the like uh, uh, comprehensive high schools uh, and technical high schools, I think the students' levels are quite high. Now, the textbook we have is Maturita Solutions, and I don't know which one we have. I think we have got the red one. Why I don't know which one we have is because I actually teach from uh, FC book. I teach from B2. Don't tell anyone. But like um, the thing is, the students are at this level. And as I said, think about it from their perspective. Think about it from parents' perspective. Uh, I spoke to uh, quite a few parents. And they were saying, like, you know, our kids were being prepared for FC and this and that. Uh, what are you going to do at school? And I'm going to tell them, well, we're just going to go two or three notches down and we'll just start with the basics. I don't know. As a parent, I would be very uh, annoyed and frustrated. So this is what we do. I still follow the syllabus. I still see Okay, we need to do present simple. Okay, I do present simple, but not here. I do it here. Uh, you know, the exercises are higher. We do listening. We do listening. We do housing. We do housing. But, you know, the vocabulary, the exercise that I will have with it, the phrasal verbs and stuff will be a lot higher than necessarily maturita solutions. But it's not my decision uh, to the, the textbook. It's the kind of collective decision of the teachers. And not every teacher at our school uh, teaches this way, but most of us are slightly but surely moving this way. Uh, the reason why we have the maturita solution intermediate level is in case if we have very weak students. But as I said, the problem is we aim at the weakest, but most of them are completely somewhere else. And to bore them with this kind of textbook, I don't know. To me, it's... Um, it's wasted opportunity, really. And we're talking about four years. And I know um, in, in language schools, language high schools, where they teach and they start with intermediate textbook. And I go, oh, my God, like, well, why? Why? But anyway, do you actually... Uh, uh -huh. Do you actually the do uh, do you achieve the student centered class while a uh, new grammar explaining? Of course not. Of course not. But as I said, sometimes I do not explain the grammar, like with with the with the conditionals, because like uh, my fourth grade students, they IT, they're not really grammar oriented people. Trust me. Okay, but. Uh, if, if you do mixed conditionals or third conditional, why do it? I know that they don't have the capacity to learn it. They will not learn it. 
But some of the grammar, which we may talk about it because it may be in syllabus or something. So we'll just quickly go over it. But I usually, if it's difficult grammar, especially if it's difficult grammar and easy grammar as well, I just set it in context. So what I try to do is, as I showed you with, with those questions, I, I think of the context. When would you be talking about third conditional? When would you be talking about second conditional? How would you be reporting? When would you be reporting? Okay, so with reporting speech, firstly, the cards are fantastic, but I have like, you, you, can, you can do like um, um, comic strips where somebody says something and then you're repeating and you're telling somebody else what the person was saying in a comic strip. Okay, and you say, okay, look, when you do it, you have to go one tense back. So if you have this, you have to go this way. You can write it on the whiteboard. And of course, teacher has to, has to set the rules, but you set the rules. You don't have to explain this is a reported speech and you have to go through lots of the stuff. You say, okay, if you go, Present goes to past, past goes to past, perfect, present perfect goes to pre past perfect, you know, will goes to wood. You can write it on the whiteboard and then you give them activity and they do it and they look at the whiteboard, they do it this way. But uh, always try, from my perspective, always try to find meaningful exercise, not just something that they do in textbook and then just go like, you know, and sleep halfway sleeping, you know, do it so that they may be telling somebody else they want to all or explain it to somebody else so that it is for the meaningful. I, I can't say that my students are always working 100% and that all students are working. You get students that, you know, are students that you never get to get work. You know, I have students that don't like some of the activities. I have class, I have a particular class that are not keen on doing these activities, but you do some difficult activity, and then they realize that maybe the speaking, even though they're introverted, might be a little bit more fun for them. So, um, yeah, uh, e.g. perfect times. I'm not, not sure what we mean here by uh, Zuzana, e.g. perfect times how do we use perf uh, like how do we use perfect time well as it, as it showed you like you know uh either through the games or through the communication i'm not sure what town or city do you teach in well i teach in part of the bit set what textbook do you use okay that was the same one uh look i because i also teach at british center i prepare for fc and cae so i uh get stuff from these textbooks but i actually create all get a lot of the stuff of the internet. I think about the lesson, what would motivate the students, get to know the students. Sometimes they tell me, because if you give, if you do the mini projects, which means they have to tell you something about themselves or about some subject, you get to know them. We do songs, for example. They present the song, song that they like, and they need to explain to us what song they like, why they like it, when they heard it. And through these things, you get to learn about them and then you think about the activities that may be fun for them or interesting for them and of course they need to be within the uh, the language that you want them to learn but a lot of the times people say okay but this takes a lot of time to prepare true but also when your class is working real hard you can actually prepare during the class i during my class when it's done well I spend like out of 45 minutes, I spend maybe 25 minutes not doing much, just supervising, making sure that they doing what they should be doing. They do the activity. I don't have to do the speaking. I can speak English. They need to practice, not me. Okay. And during that lesson, I can watch, think, do something, watch, do something, and I can prepare for the next lesson. Uh, this is not like I am... Like I am not doing my work properly because I am not giving all the input. I am not in the center of attention. In fact, it's very difficult sometimes, I would say, to let go and let go and let them do it because that's really what we want. We want them to do it. Okay, so um, anyway, I don't know if I answered that question uh, to work in different parts. Yes, okay. Yes, definitely. That's a good question, Veronica. Uh, but sometimes it is really hard to persuade them Definitely. And I have students that don't like working with anyone. So they work with me. You know, like I get if I have two students that are introverted, don't want to work with anyone. Well, I team up with them because the other ones don't need me. They are working alone. They don't really need me. So I team up with them. If they really, really you can have some students that can be really, 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 really tough. OK, fine. Well, it's tough. I give them some other work to do. Something may be tough. Something 
if I want to kind of make them feel a little bit, little bit, um, I usually don't do it very often. I usually, really, the, the way I solve the problem mostly is that I team up with them and they usually don't like to be team up with me. So eventually they get to work. But but you have some students that no matter what you do, they, they will not want to work. But that's life. That's that's in that's that's just life, you know. But the aim for you is not to make everyone happy, but most of them, and especially the ones that can be motivated. Uh, if 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 you have a class and nobody's motivated. I would say, from my perspective, when this happens to me, I have to think real hard. Why? Because I don't believe it's the class. There has to be something that I'm not doing right, and I need to kind of find a way how to make them interested. Sure, there are difficult classes, there are difficult students, and sometimes you can't please all everyone. That's just life, you know. But I try to make sure that everybody's working because this is this is that's that's my job. My job is to get them work, not to be talking all the time and telling them stuff. And how much time do you spend with each part of topic-based learning? It depends. Depends. No, <laughs> no. Uh, uh, you've got seven parts. That's five. No, no. I told you, like, uh, for example, the project can then take one lesson. Now, very often, my colleagues, uh, not saying colleagues here at uh, my school, but at our school, they get them to do all this stuff at home, the projects. Why? If they do it at home, they do it by themselves. They're not really practicing the language. If they do it in class, <laughs> When you think about it, if you have students that can pass maturita in first grade, and I would say most of you have, most of your students can pass it, if not in first grade, then in second and definitely in third grade, which means fourth grade, what are you going to be doing? So you can spend the time doing these activities where they actually, so I, I tell them, okay, we'll do it in the class. But this is not that they're sitting and doing they, they are talking, they are, they are speaking in English, and this is, this is what I want them to do. Because when you think about it, when I teach privately, everybody wants to do the speaking because they can do listening, they can do reading, they can do other things on their own, but speaking not, and they need to practice. So I want them to do as much speaking as possible and through that learn the rest. I'll teach the rest. I mean, I'm sorry. And, and uh, you know, so, uh, so I don't know if that answered your question, uh, but I, uh, for example, as I said, well, the brainstorming doesn't take five minutes. Brainstorming takes, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes because we, they do the brainstorming, then we write it on the whiteboard, then we discuss the words, then we maybe uh, fo do follow up with speaking. Then following lesson, if uh, or this lesson, maybe do a reading, maybe don't, maybe we'll do the listening. And just this may take the project based, or I mean topic based. It may take four or five lessons, you know. Sometimes two, sometimes three. Also depends on syllabus, of course. But but some things you can incorporate from other parts of the syllabus, you know. So if if for example I need to teach present perfect, and I know I'll be doing the present perfect through the speaking, well then you know the present perfect is kind of uh, integrated into the into the topic even though I should be moving from the topic, let's say, of house, and the next thing should be listening. Well, the listening is in the house. So the next lesson I should be doing reading, that could be also the house. So I, I devote as much time as I am allowed within the syllable and as, as much time as I feel is interesting to students and useful to students. Um, that's how much time I devote to it. As I said, even with the playing the Minecraft, you know, some people would say, well, you devote a lesson, sometimes two lessons to them playing Minecraft in a computer. Yeah, why not? I mean, it's not that they're just doing a lesson. They say, okay, well, we're going to, well, what do we need here? I think we're going to put here this. Yeah, what about here? They're actually talking. They're talking about the house. So they're really, yeah, they're playing Minecraft, but they're speaking. All The, the classroom is buzzing. And if they're not buzzing and they're not speaking, well, then I might, might tell them, okay, look, uh, you're not actually talking. Or if they start speaking, check. Kids start speaking. But the classes I have had for longer than a year, uh, they hardly ever use Czech in class because they know I always stop them. Don't speak Czech, speak English. This is, the, this is what I want you to be doing. I want you to be speaking about it. I don't want you to be just doing something and talking Czech. This is not a game.
So, um, you know, and if they're not speaking, it's like, okay, well, okay, stop. We're not going to do the project. We'll do something else. We'll do phrasal verbs. You know, when they hear phrasal verbs, they, that gets them motivated to do something that I want them to do. But anyway, what, what uh, level of students are you teaching? Well, look, I am, I am teaching the same students as you are teaching, really. Uh, uh, if you're teaching at high school, if you're teaching at primary school, all of this is applicable to high uh, to primary school. You just go one notch lower, two notch lower, uh, two notches lower, or you go one notch higher. You know, you just move it. You just move it. Uh, Depending on your students, I mean, I have uh, thir- I have first graders that are better than than uh, fourth graders. Yeah, okay. So I'm not going to be teaching. You know, like why would I be teaching the same stuff I taught my fourth graders two years ago? Now the first graders, if they're somewhere else. And similarly, I can't teach the same thing. I'm teaching my first graders, uh, the fourth graders, because they, they're preparing for B1. They're just at B1 level. I'm not going to teach them C, C1. That, that's crazy. But my third grade students, I'm doing C1 with them because what else am I going to do with them when they I give them C1 test and they pass it? Why should I teach them B1 level? Just because, you know, we've got this textbook. I, I don't know. I mean, again, I, I feel that syllabus and, uh, and curriculum tells me, you know, what I need to be teaching, but not how, you know, topics, skills. I'm doing that. But like, you know, the level I play with it myself. So, yeah, the students uh, look, uh, you know, first graders, the, the ones I teach, they're really at B2 level. Third grade, I don't teach second graders. I teach third graders. They they between B2 and uh, C1 level, so I, you know, sub use uh, the the exercises and stuff from this level. And my fourth graders, they're at B1 level, so I, I, I use B1 level style book. I actually use the textbook that we have uh, set because for them it's appropriate. I don't use all the exercises. I just make sure that the exercises are the ones that they they. Uh, I'd be okay with. Uh, could you recommend any online domino creators? Ah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I, I didn't think about that. Uh, how do I do dominoes? I usually, actually, uh, th- this domino that you have is usually I, I try not to do anything if I can, okay? Because uh, I just, if, if, if it's on internet, why bother doing it yourself? But of course, so the domino I showed you that was from ESL Collective. So you can type in, like go to Google. I use Yahoo because I'm an old fossil and I'm used to using Yahoo. So type in, type in, uh, in, in Google, Domino, say what you want, maybe house, uh, a vocabulary with house, and then uh, search and go through the, like the pictures and look at the pictures and usually find something. If not, uh, then you have to find it yourselves. I, I actually... Uh, can't think of it because usually when I when I do it, I just search and say Domino generator and it pops up. I, I knew that uh, you might be asking about uh, bingo. That's why I, I looked for it. And to be honest, it took me about half an hour to find it because uh, in past it was much easier, but now all of them are paid. The one I, I uh, posted here is unpaid. Can you repeat what pictures are in? The full picture presentation. Okay, look, uh, it's simple. You, um, it's simple. If uh, in textbook, you always have pictures kids need to be describing. And for me, okay, some, some are good, some are not so good. So what I do is I ask them to bring their pictures. I usually set the topic because otherwise they're going to bring, you know, like uh, all sorts of pictures. So I say, look, if I want them to speak, Usually they all want to speak about the games they like playing and they probably talk about the same game. You know, I, I don't know what they're playing now these days, but, you know, War of Tanks or something or, you know, something like that. So I ask them to bring picture of, you know, they can do the print screen from, from the game. Then I say the second one, uh, for example, a person they like talking to, you know, could be friend, could be mom, could be dad, could be grandma, grandpa. I don't care. They bring the person they want to be talking about. Then I usually say something like, uh, you know, as I said, maybe some outdoor activity. I don't know what else I said because it it, it varies, you know, it varies. It, does, it doesn't have to be sometimes picture from holiday, you know, the place like 
because it gets them talking. They're talking about something that they are, they know quite well, something that is close to their heart, and that opens them up. If you give them picture about, I don't know, something from the textbook, that may not open them up because they see it as artificial exercise and they might not want to be talking about this particular picture. But if they bring the pictures themselves, they're their pictures, well, they're very likely to tell us something and they're likely to be speaking. Of course, if you have introvert who doesn't like to be speaking in front of the class, well, then get them speak from the, from the, from the, from the seat. Yeah, but as I said, those four picture presentation, it, it could be anything. It could be anything. It's it's up to you. What, what do you want to know? Yeah, I said food because I love talking about food. So, you know, the food. And they usually love talking about food too. Yeah, most of them will come up with pizza or, 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 or schnitzel or something, but that's fine. That's fine. But they tell you what they like eating, maybe places, uh, whether they eat more at home, whether they like going to restaurants, which restaurants they like, which is the best restaurant in their town because I have kids from different towns. You know, I'm thinking speaking. So you, I, you as a teacher set, uh, set uh, the theme of the topic. When do you do reading? Do asses read out loud? Yes, students read out loud to the whole class. Usually not, usually not. Uh, uh, and, and this is, this is the, I, and I'll tell you what, why, because uh, when they're reading, uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. If they're doing the matching exercise, no, because I think it's much quicker if they do it. Sometimes they're not so happy to read out in uh, loud in class. But then we also do normal exercises where they need to read out. I mean, I'm not saying throw out all the exercises. I'm just saying supplement them as much with other fun interesting stuff but if you know your students have real problems with i don't know creating questions in present simple just give them exercise in present simple and then when you go through the class will everybody read something but try to minimize these kind of activities if you can and i think we all can but uh and and with the reading i usually uh i usually also tell them that uh i, I like them to do the reading in like for example the bingo i don't know we probably I don't know if anyone's still still here with me, but uh, I think the times is almost up. But I still have a few more questions, so I'll I'll try to answer them. I'm sorry I connected really late. It's recorded. Yeah, recording is available. When working with fun cards, how much time do you spend doing this activity? Again, it really depends. I uh, to be honest, uh, the fun cards and cards like, for example, I don't know if you know exploding kittens, or I have other activities like you know uh, the one I don't know if you know Inglorious Bastards when you have the name of the character or of the um, uh, of the real person and you're guessing. I like doing these uh, usually around Christmas or between semesters, so I spend a fair bit of time because. The, the grades are closed. Students don't, are not really motivated to do anything. So we, we, I, I try to play more games. Uh, sometimes we watch a film and talk about the film. But when I watch the film, usually I try to make sure that the film has some relevance to them. So, for example, uh, the films I like watching uh, are, are, are Hidden Figures, which is about Afro-American ladies working for NASA in 50s or 60s. So you have the racial tensions there, ladies, you know, but then they, they, they like watching it because it's about NASA. It's about, you know, uh, technical stuff. So they like it. So the kind of movies, not, not just mindless movies. So, but uh, with the games, Again, it's up to you. I think I think it's really up to you. You know, when they like playing it, the game, you know, I don't know, I spend 20 minutes. Uh, not a whole lesson. I would not say whole lesson. But if they like playing whole lesson, what's so wrong if they play a whole lesson? They are talking in English and they, and they are doing the grammar you want them to be practicing. And again, you can play this game if you want. I, I think it's better if you don't play overly long. And if you play uh, more times, just like with, with the dominoes, as I said, uh, which means you play that game, maybe one, two games, which can be five, 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, one lesson. And then next lesson, you know, revising the, the, the grammar again, just say, okay, well, let's play the game again. You'll find that most students love playing Uno. I mean, I love playing it. Okay. So again, the timing, I think, don't take it from me. This is... You, you are the facilitators. You are the ones or mediators or teachers or how, however you like to see it. You are the ones 
who are managing the classroom. And you see, it's working, they're working, everything's fun. You know, I mean, as I said, I mean, I really am elated or I'm really happy to leave classroom when I see the students going, laughing, having fun. And this is all in English. I mean, what can you ask for more? You know, and you know they are learning. So if they, if if we're playing card games, we're playing card games. You know, I, I know my colleagues, they have different card games. Everybody likes different games. So, you know, if you have different games that you like, I know that there's some game Kahoot. I've never played it really, but uh, kids like it, teachers like it. Uh, my, my, my colleagues, they love using the lyrics training. Um, I am not so keen because I tried it a few times with students and they were not so keen on it because the problem is find the right song. You play a song that you really like and they go, oh, you know, it's an old fart song, you know, like it's... Uh, so to find the right song and, and you will not always please everybody, but, you know, some some kids love it. So, you know, that's that's also another activity that you could be doing. OK, I think I've got the last question here. So if, if you have a drill exercise in the textbook, e.g. Uh, classic gap fill grammar, how do you work with it? Do you let them fill it in and then check the answers with the whole class? Sure, why not? Sure, not. I mean, come on, come on. I'm not saying that these exercises are not on. They are fine. They're, they're fine uh, to do this. If you're preparing for FC or CAE, you got to do them. You get to prepare the students, but they should not be the dom They should not dominate. Well, I, I can't tell you what they should be doing to you, but like in my case, I would not like these exercises to dominate my lessons. It may be one lesson spent doing this, okay? The way I actually do it is the first time I do it with, with kids, I usually actually write the words so that they get acquainted with the, with the exercise. So I write the words on the, on the whiteboard, uh, obviously jumbled so they know what's going on and then, then, then do it. But, you know, I, I am not saying, I'm not saying that the, you should completely leave the textbook out. You should never do any exercises from the textbook. That's not what I'm saying. I, 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 what I'm saying is find the exercises that are meaningful to the students. Sometimes they may not be extremely meaningful, for example, this gap fill. But if they're doing the gap fill, and you can find, like uh, I do it sometimes that uh, uh, I, I take three gap fill and get students to do different gap fills. And then I give them the answers or they get the answers. But then uh, they need to tell the other groups about the gap fill exercise they were doing because the gap fill is an article. It's always an article. So what you can do is, okay, let's do the gap fill. That's got to be done. It's necessary. But let's turn it into something more. What was it about? The topic. If you can find a good, interesting topic, they will want to talk about it. If it's not an interesting topic, okay, we'll do it if you can't find anything else. But if you can find something that is interesting, we'll turn it into speaking because the gap fill is an article about some topic. If it's topical, let's say gap fill about housing and you've got the vocabulary with houses, grammar, um, I don't know, um, uh, uh, dependent prepositions or you know all the different stuff that actually gap fill uh, tests, they will do it. I mean, the same thing, listening from textbook. I, I think they're fantastic listening in textbooks, but make sure that the, the listening is right level and also the, the topic is really appropriate for your classroom because sometimes we do listening and nobody really wants to do this listening. And we think, and then, and sometimes you check the exercise and you go, but some of the questions are ambiguous, not really. I'm not saying don't do the, the listening. I think some of the listening exercise is fantastic, but make sure that you what you're doing is something that you want to be doing and the students want to be doing. That's that's all. But you know. So I don't know if this answered all your questions. I'm sorry that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that the time is already up. I, it's very difficult for me to, to plan this because I don't know how long, uh, you know, everything takes and I usually talk a lot. So, but not, as I said, not in my classroom, uh, not in my classroom. I don't talk this much. Okay. So anyway, well, let's wrap it up. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it or at least, it was useful. I hope that most of you know what I'm talking about. Most of you probably are very likely to do the same thing. So I hope you enjoyed it and it was somehow useful. Um, the, the seminar will be available to you. That's why I've got lots of stuff there that I, maybe some of it I didn't talk much about. Uh, but as I said, I didn't really want to go 
too much into activities themselves because look if you go to esl collective if you if you type whatever in google and go to pictures because then the pictures you, you look at the picture and see okay this is good this is not good yeah I, i want this and you can quickly really quickly search through the google or through yahoo or, or, or something and you can find the right appropriate exercise okay i think we all can do that uh also uh one of the one of the things that uh is here is uh one of the textbooks uh the uh, activities textbooks uh they're available um in shops but i have it from library like we have fantastic library here in part of it's the uh it's the british centers li library but they have similar library in habits and in places you can go become a member you can borrow these books lots of different activities and stuff so anyway thank you for your attention and who knows maybe one day i'll see you in person so take care okay bye bye